I'm John Lyles, and along with Garrett Jorgensen, we're both New Mexico cavers and members of Fort Stanton Cave Study Project. This talk is about the exploration of Fort Stanton Cave, specifically in October of 2019, when three weekend trips each uh, added up to five point, almost 5.5 miles of new cave. Um, Garrett was the trip leader for all three of those trips. I was on one of the trips, so uh, I'm going to report on all three here and, uh, and have some uh, photos of some of the new areas we found. Fort Stanton Cave is in south central New Mexico, shown with a red dot here about partially between Roswell and Socorro along Highway 380. It's near the town of Capitan and the village of Lincoln. Lincoln is known for the Lincoln County War and 1880s with uh, Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid and all that. Um, Ruidoso is the nearest larger town with a few more stores. Um, the cave is managed by the Bureau of Land Management and uh, it's a fairly big project. So uh, around 2005, the U.S. government declared it a national conservation area, the Snowy River Discovery. And so that part of the cave has got extra management attention because of that designation. And uh, actually the whole cave is, is covered under that, but the cave has already outgrown that conservation area by its size as it continues to grow. Here's the only entrance to the entire cave. It's uh, about an eight hour trek by walking and crawling to the uh, 10 mile point on Snowy River in the south at Midnight Junction. It's uh, a little bit further to get into the complex of cave after Midnight Junction. And the cave uh, generally goes, the, the Snowy River generally goes on a 220 degree bearing to the southwest. But you can see in this slide, in 2018, we added about three miles to the cave, and those were not at the far southwest extension of the cave. That area hasn't been reached since 2014 due to regular flooding every year. We haven't been able to mount an expedition down there to the uh, midnight junction. But the green areas are off the middle of Snowy River, which is easier to reach from the entrance. And Garrett Jorgensen started the uh, the Bliss survey in July of 2014. And uh, he first headed south, and then you can see the green area is in 2018, uh, the, the final bit of survey that he added to Bliss in 2018. And uh, then to the north is what we're gonna talk about in this particular uh, uh, report. And that's was called Bliss North, but we came up with a better name once we got in it in 2018. So in October of 2018, we went this far and we named it Gold Rush. And so Snowy River is coming along. You can see it makes a big bend to the west and then it goes south again. And right at that big bend, um, that's where an upper joint opens up and we were able to climb up into there with a hand line and get up into Bliss to the south or to Gold Rush to the north. And the first thing you reach is the A. Clincher Traverse. I'll have more on that in a little bit. Then Donner Pass, which is a tight hole that we were able to get barely get our bodies through that gets you into a much bigger passage on the far side. And you reach Cripple Creek, which um, Cripple Creek is a prominent uh, east going passage, which we left in 2018 and didn't even push, and then went north on to Tatlin Junction. Tatlin Junction was a great big lead that uh, walking passage, and we just ran out of time in October of 2018 on the one trip that we did to push that. So uh, that was the goal of this year to go back to Tetlin Junction first, then go to Cripple Creek, and then a few other side leads off of that. Um, the first trip of this year, however, was a radio location and a reconnaissance trip of, uh, in September of 2019. Those uh, uh, were necessary because one thing, radio location had been on the agenda and planned since uh, 2014, 
to do one location at Midnight Junction to establish a good surface location. Also, a uh, location is needed if we ever needed to drill a rescue shaft or something. And we would know where to, you know, place that more accurately over Snowy River. And Midnight Junction is a, 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 a big area with lots of, uh, that's actually a campsite down there now. Um, also, we wanted to evaluate what happened from the flood of 2018 to 2019 and how uh, did it affect Snowy River. So in these photos, you see Garrett Jorgensen looking at the beacon loop at the field house. And in the middle photo, you see the beacon loop, the uh, three altimeters, um, the cave beacon and battery and the framework for the antenna loop um, as they were gonna get packed into someone's cave pack. And then uh, I wanted to mention the guy on the left on the floor is Bob Beecher. And Bob just passed away uh, about a week ago, early, um, and this is uh, the first week of July. So he, he passed away and uh, we were really gonna miss him. He's had a big part in this project since the beginning. And he's uh, sort of the MacGyver of Fort Stanton Cave. He's come up with all kinds of techniques and devices. The cave beacon is a Brian Peace design, but Bob has really mastered it for the cave. And uh, he's always the surface person with the receiver. And I'm usually the transmitter person in the cave with the beacon. Um, then um, Bob also built some portable, inexpensive LIDAR systems that you may have heard about. And they're used to uh, do three-dimensional cloud uh, plots of the cave. And um, uh, Bob also had early cave radios on some of the early Snowy River trips. He provided those so that we could communicate to the surface. And uh, anyway, I just wanted to bring up that we've, uh, we've lost Bob. And to the right is what happened on this trip. On September 27th, we ran into water about seven or eight miles in uh, of our 10-mile trip. We hit this water, and the water was moving slowly, and it was wall to wall further in, so we stopped and decided to retreat because, for one thing, we didn't want to damage Snowy River by walking over the wet floor with our muddy boots. And, and you know, uh, the Snowy River formation is pretty soft when it's, when it's being formed, when the calcite's being deposited. And also, there's a sump before this point that could fill up and trap person. So we wanted to, uh, we just didn't want to risk it staying in there and not knowing that that water was moving and there was a wave of water or what. It turned out to be just sort of a, a segment of water left over from the previous flooding that was still moving a little bit. And uh, we learned a lot on this trip, but we turned around. The surface team didn't even know what happened. They were listening on the receiver through the night until late at night, and they finally gave up on us, not knowing what happened to us. And well, what happened is we came out of the cave. So we got out at about six in the morning and left them a note not to wake us up and told them what happened. <laughs> this is uh, what happens when Eagle Creek uh, is running with uh, water on the surface. And Eagle Creek is a few miles to the south of the upstream end of Snowy River. I, I say the end, it's not the end of Snowy River. It's the upstream big lead of Snowy River that we haven't pushed. And Eagle Creek is just beyond that. And uh, you can see it rained pretty hard. And then around the 23rd to 25th, the water went up quite a bit in the creek and then came down again. But the 30th of October of that year was when Snowy River began flooding. So when this was happening, the last expedition of 2018 was canceled. And uh, the cave flooded through that winter and into the 2019 period. Um, 2019... Um, there was a big concern after our radio location trip was aborted that uh, the cave was gonna be flooding again pretty quickly because the weather was calling for flash floods in the area in early October. So the first of the week, it was looking pretty bad. And then towards the end of the week, the flash flood did not happen around Snowy River and Fort Stanton Cave. And uh, we were able to field the first expedition. And um, this is what I'm gonna talk about now. There were three weekends. Each one was a two-day trip. Garrett Jorgensen uh, had the permits to push these trips, so he led the teams. And each one was an overnight trip. 
with uh, camping without a stove, and we uh, just took a good long rest. We had sleeping bags and pads, and then we uh, carried them with us. We didn't set up any permanent type campsites. We just basically carried what we could in our packs. And uh, so luckily the rainstorms missed us, and so the next trip started happening. And here's the beginning, October 4th and 5th. We had Nick, Jer uh, Nick Anderson and Adam Weaver from South Dakota. Those are the two on the left. Then we had Derek Wolf from Colorado in the uh, yellow shirt, and then Garrett on the right in black. This is the A clincher. And uh, I mentioned earlier, this is the first thing you reach after you climb up out of Snowy River and take the north route towards Gold Rush. Um, it's, a, it's a ledge that you go along, you're looking down about 40 feet to the floor. Snowy River is directly below those big slots in this joint in the floor. And uh, you're moving along very carefully, trying not to drop your pack over the edge. And also you notice the ledge doesn't have a lot of uh, space for standing up. It also doesn't have a flat floor. It slopes towards the drop. So when we went across it the first time, some of us were terrified, but we went ahead because there was big booming passage ahead. And then coming out, we had the same uh, uh, concerns coming across the A clincher. But uh, we knew we were going to have to put a hand line in there and make this a little safer for the next team. This is the uh, A clincher in October 4th of 2019 with Nick and Derek uh, drilling and putting in bolts to put the safety line across that traverse. Um, they did it, and it works really well. Garrett made a lightweight harness system out of thin webbing that could be tied into a seat and have a carabiner. And each person would put that on, go across, and either pass it back or wear another one so we had enough of them so we could uh, get through and then come back out with them. This is what Gold Rush looks like. This is actually not new discovery. This is last year's discovery. When I say last year, I mean the 2018 discovery of Gold Rush. So you can see there's a flowstone floor and there's silt banks on the sides. And at this point, uh, we're getting to a point where we're changing our shoes from putting shoe covers on to protect the floor from our, our dirty shoes. And uh, this is uh, a Cripple Creek passage with remarkable flowstone formations and pool formations that were there that were discovered in uh, 2018. This is an area we, it's a, giant passage that we went through and in 2019 in October um, it became obvious that it's a fault. It's not just a big tall passage but you can see that the left wall and the right wall have displaced bedding planes in them and uh, so it became real evident that we were crossing a big fault here. The Indian Divide was a um, area where we went over uh, the tall big passage fall rubble on the floor started changing and uh, beyond this we came to an area we call the perfect passage and uh, Garrett's team on that first trip surveyed a lot of footage in this passage it was easy survey walking passage and uh, it continued and then eventually they started finding upper levels dropping into it but um, first they hit these spectacular gypsum beards in the perfect passage. The one on the left is maybe two and a half feet tall and it's coming from a little ledge in the ceiling down to the floor. Looks like a shower and the one on the right is a more traditional gypsum beard like you would see in a cave like Lechuguilla that sort of moves when you walk by if you're not careful from the wind currents that you make. So it's a no wake zone. Um, beyond this the cave changes and the perfect passage ends and you reach this large chamber that just has rubble on the floor going over hills and a fairly flat ceiling and what's real interesting here is off to the right and up it's a dark big lead up there and that's uh that balcony it became part of the expeditions later to explore that level but on this trip garrett and his team went straight through and stayed and then the passage started to look like it was going to end on them but they discovered 
uh, way up to the right, and they climbed up and reached into an area that's got flowstone and aragonite that's directional and styles and columns. It was quite amazing um, to find directional aragonite in the cave, much less that nice of directional aragonite, which indicates good airflow is going through that passage. I'll get back to this uh, stalactite that you see on the right on a later slide. I have a close-up of it. Garrett's team um, went following the passage with all the flowstone and uh, eventually reached a large pit that they climbed down and got into a lower level passage that turned out to be um, much less decorated, but it headed continuing to the north and east. And uh, they continued this passage for a lot of footage and eventually ended at that level and uh, believe they were getting close to the historic part of the cave, specifically an area known as Ingle Hill in the Lincoln Caverns part of uh, Fort Stanton Cave. They weren't sure how far they were from it at that time, but they had run out of time. This was after they had taken a, a, a sleep and they were surveying all the next morning and then they started to head out. And on the way out, they, they took a route they, they, they explored Cripple Creek, basically, going east. And as they went on Cripple Creek, um, it headed around, circled around, and came back into a, a small, tight area with a hole. They climbed up through the hole into this breakdown room that's called Mental Breakdown. At this point, it continued. It pinched down to small passage, crawling passage, and they popped out in a lead that was very close to the A-clincher. It was in that first straight section, and this lead we had left in 2018. I had said it's a dig, it's not open. Well, they came out of it, so it was open, but it was real tight, and uh, they just managed to, you know, if you really looked hard, you'd find your way through it. We didn't look hard enough in 2018 because we had big booty going the other way, so we left it. So they made a loop and took this route out, and uh, it's, it's, you know, not sure that it's as e any easier than the Donner Pass route, but uh, they mapped it. And so you see here what they've surveyed on that trip. They surveyed 12,473 feet, which is a record for anybody on a two-day trip in this cave, and uh, a little over two miles. It's the area that you see with the arrows. That's all new that they did on that trip. And you can see how close they got to Ingle Hill in the historic part of the cave. Also, um, the other place marked on this map is the loop they did from Cripple Creek back to the first passage near the A clincher. So this shows the, how close they had reached to the historic part of the cave. And um, you can see uh, there's a little gap between them. And... Uh, so the next team was to go back there and push in this area because they didn't quite make it to the back of Ingle Hill on this trip. So the next trip was the following weekend. It had John Dunham from the Northeast, Garrett, Brian Kendrick, and myself from New Mexico. We passed those neat aragonite bushes and saw a little bit more there, all of, all of its directional. Um, and after we crossed over the pit that Garrett's team had gone down, we were in clean gear at this point, and uh, we came across this nice column, and the cave kept going. So at this point, we were going in flowstone, so we had to get all clean uh, shoe covers on and continue. Then it changed again and went dirty on us. And uh, when it went dirty, we uh, found that um, we were in a forest of styles and the, the route was a crawl and we had to be very careful not to hit the ceiling or any of these styles. And the most obvious route crawled over to a, a pit and the pit completely blocked the way. And I looked over the edge, it was belled out and it would have been probably at least 15, maybe 20 feet to the floor. And there was another walking trunk down there that we couldn't get to. We didn't have vertical gear, we didn't have a rope, so that still remains as a big lead down there.
but to get to it is an, a very long trip. And uh, anyway, uh, we continued through this little forest here and found our way beyond it, went over several more hills, and came back into classic Fort Stanton cave passage with a crust on the floor, with a bit of silt, a bit of clay and mud, and uh, a little bit of flowstone, and uh, some nice decorations. After a couple of thousand feet, um, we, we started, the passage got big and it started resembling Lincoln Caverns in the historic part of the cave. At least that's what we were thinking. And, and that's what you see here. It's starting to get big and it's meandering. And this is where all that airflow was coming from. Now this is the double stalactite I showed earlier. I just show uh, that it has, um, it has a, a, a sort of a pendant on the left and on the right it has a bunch of popcorn and aragonite and I believe this is probably the airflow effect. Um, you know, the wind currents and the preferential deposition on one side versus the other, but it's kind of interesting that it's a twin pendant there. And then on the right you see broken uh, columns. These actually never touched uh, the ceiling and the floor offset. And, and something shifted in the floor, we believe, and caused that. And all over that area, all the columns and all the formations are misaligned. Here's Garrett going up a flowstone slope, fairly steep slope, with his shoe covers on, his dirty pack behind him, and we we're being very careful not to set those packs down onto the floor in these parts of the cave. We have to wait till we get to a dirty section to put your pack down and get your get your uh, any gear out or water or food or anything. Continuing along, the passage is looking more and more like the passage in Lincoln Caverns on the other side of Ingle Hill breakdown. At this point, uh, the floor even looks like what we call Snake River in, in, in Lincoln Caverns. Here we have a giant breakdown pile, which we determined to be the far side of Ingle Hill, which is the dig in Lincoln Caverns that's been going for many years. And uh, actually, I dug in that area just last year, two different times, and I'll talk about that later. But we reached this side of it, and uh, we could not get through. But we could feel air, and uh, it was definitely, definitely looked like the far side of Ingle Hill, and later plotted out to be exactly that. And the connection point that looks most promising is this small passage that was in a, in a lower passage that we went around and, and, and came back into the bottom of the breakdown. It turns out it wasn't the bottom of the breakdown, it's sort of the middle of the breakdown. But this thing is, uh, we named it Capitan Gap. Capitan Gap because there's a gap between it and Lincoln Caverns. That's an also, a, uh, Capitan Gap is a feature on the highway going into uh, uh, Capitan, New Mexico. And here's Garrett sketching and you could feel the air rushing through here, but we couldn't move the rocks. They were cemented, and it was too tight to get through. We would need tools to break through here. So it looks like a pretty formidable dig from this side, considering how far you have to go. You're, you're at least eight miles from the entrance at this point. And uh, you can see here, the green is what we had surveyed the two different weekends. And we had reached almost to Lincoln Caverns. And the little green thing off the Red Passage is the digging I had done with the team twice in 2019. So you can see we're headed in the same direction. And here you can see the profile. And uh, you can see that the dig coming in from the right in Ingle Hill in Lincoln Caverns is headed directly for the passage we had surveyed last October. And uh, there's still three to 400 feet between them. And that's Lincoln, that's a Capitan Gap right there. Once we had reached the far side of Ingle Hill and weren't able to go further, we turned around, found a good place to bivy and set up camp for the night on a nice flowstone floor. This was about two in the morning. And we slept, had a good night's sleep, woke up and then packed and started heading out, took lots of photos, and we stopped at the perfect passage to look at some of the upper level 
passages that we could see. And once we got up into them, we realized they were upper paleo passages that were very large, big chunks of passage up there with lots of straight shots and uh, big dimensions. So um, here, here's surveying along up in that section. And, uh, you can see what we did. This uh, The upper green on the right is uh, the section that almost reaches Ingle Hill. And the lower left green section is the balcony area along parallel to the uh, to the perfect passage and up above. And we left good leads up there. We left one. I went to one area where I popped up in the floor of a room, a giant room, and I was on the edge of it. And we just ran out of time and couldn't survey it. So we left it for the next team to go and finish all that, which they did. October 18th to 20th was the final team of uh, the 2019 surveys. And uh, Garrett had three permits, so this is the third one. Garrett was leading the trip again, and Raymond Armin from the northeast on the right, and then Derek Bristol on the lower left, and Ben Smith, both from Colorado, um, were the team. Um, they started working in the upper level passage at the end of Indian Divide, and this is where the perfect passage is a lower level and there's an upper passage above that. And that's what they're getting into here. You can see the size of this stuff. And uh, here they are up in this passage. They only went about a thousand feet before they connected back into the main survey, but the floor was very interesting in the parts of that. That's all mud cracks. And you can see a small trail on the, what they made through there with a little bit of flagging. Uh, then they got into a real decorated area with velvet flowstone formations. Unfortunately, it ended in breakdown a couple of hundred feet past this area. So they resumed survey in another upper level complex of cave, hoping again to break out and find something parallel. Again, this is big borehole. Uh, it connected back into the main Capitan Cavern survey, but it, it was very nice survey and uh, big big booty up there. And then they decided to work on some of the leads that had been left. They still had some time on the clock before they had to start heading out. So one lead led into a big, large meandering loop that looped around. And so they surveyed that. It turned into some fairly nice passage with uh, formations, again, with Lincoln Caverns-like passage, quite decorated. and some fairly nice mop-up survey. At this point, they're showing uh, gypsum and calcite formations in the same crawl or low area. A big silt bank here. Um, blackness could be seen in one direction. The other direction ended in the silt bank. But uh, going off to the, uh, I believe it's the southwest or maybe west, this blackness headed off for a few hundred. Then they found scorched earth. Scorched earth is a 70 to 100 foot wide, 30 to 50 foot high, few hundred foot long room with some of the best flowstone formations in the entire cave. The black velvet flowstone is very rare at all in this cave, and that's how it got the name scorched earth. Um, further on, there was an orange color, colored flowstone river dry riverbed. They followed that a little ways and there was a small room under the ledge where Derek is standing here and if you look you can see under there are velvet pool fingers. Very rare and not seen like this in this cave. Beyond that the cave ended again in a flowstone area that was blocked by breakdown. And uh, because of that there's been a lot of speculation as to what might be on, be beyond scorched earth, uh, how we'll ever get to that piece of passage, and does it connect back around to uh, other parts of the known cave? And so uh, there's a lot of interest in that area. Um, here you have uh, a lead off of Tetlin Junction that was left in 2018, and this low muddy passage led to the drain, which became too tight. So this team surveyed 11,000 and uh, you can see in green scorched earth is that 
finger going off to the southwest and uh, the uh, upper level passages are the green parallel passages in the middle. 40.15 miles is the length of the cave after that trip. At this point, uh, the survey ended, and um, I wanted to point out that um, the May issue of NSS News, the May 2020 issue, has an article by uh, Weaver, Wolf, and Jorgensen, and Fort Stanton Cave, Discovery of Capitan Caverns. So you can read that and get a lot more detail than I could cover in this talk and also more photographs of these areas. This is a pasted together map from the survey books showing Captain Caverns. Um, um, scorched Earth is on the far southwest end and the Gold Rush connection to the Gold Rush is down off to the lower left part of the map. And with that, at this point, uh, I'd like to acknowledge the photographers and uh, the BLM, Newt Peterson of the BLM, for supporting and permitting this work to the Fort Stanton Cave Study Project for um, encouraging and supporting this project and these surveys. Thank you.